So I want to um, do an exercise to help you experience how these ego states uh, function in terms of decision making. So what I'd like for you to do is pick a couple of other people that you would like to do an exercise with and get in groups of three and then I'll give you some further instructions. So just pick, two out, pick out two other people you would like to work with and um, Okay, so I want you to be the three ego states of a single individual. So just take a minute and decide who's going to be parent, who's going to be adult, and who's going to be a child. Who's going to be child. And for purposes of the exercise, you're going to set aside your other two ego states and only role play that one ego state. So just decide. Yeah. Okay, so for purposes of the exercise, <laughs> um, the situation is this. Uh, you are a 17-year-old female who is coming home from your high school prom, and you're riding with your boyfriend, and you know it's been raining heavily, and the bridge up ahead is washed out. And uh, this is the only route home without driving about 100 miles out of the way. And you notice there's a motel over on the left. And so you have to make a decision about what you're going to do. So those who are playing parent ego state give input about what the person should do in this situation, ought to do or whatever. Um, people who are role playing child give input about what you're wanting to do um, and argue for what you want and those who are adult bring in the reality factors um, in the situation so again set aside your other two ego states and only role play that one ego state and come to a decision about how you're going to handle the situation okay a decision about what you're going to do uh, you have to, the three of you have to come up with a single decision, right? So you've got to talk among yourselves about what you're going to do. Okay? Uh-huh. Has everybody reached a decision about what you're going to do? Anybody need more time? Okay. So what I want to do is check in with some of the groups and just see what you've decided. Um, how about here? Who was parent? Who was adult? Who was child? We have decided that. Well, first of all, which ego state were you? Adult. Uh huh. Parent. And child. Okay. So. We have decided that if the rain is continuing and the um, and, and 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 the rain is going to 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 limit us our transportation, yeah. we are going to stay at the hotel at the motel. But the girl in the bedroom and the boy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what, and we are going to to. To make a, a phone call to our parents to uh -huh. to let them know that we are fine. Okay. And um, how about here? Who was parent? Who was adult? Who was child? I was the child. Uh huh. And um, I was freaking out. Uh -huh. I was scared, clinging to him, panicking. Mm -hmm. um, when we referred to the parent, she was very comforting. 
which pulled me out of that fight or flight mm -hmm. mode. Yeah. And then I was able to go into more of the adult thinking mm -hmm. and think of a solution. Okay, let's check with your adult. Okay. My adult told me, go ahead and find a solution and try to avoid going the 100 extra miles out of the way. Uh -huh. Just find a solution. And after you've done that, if there's nothing else to do, then just go ahead and do the hotel uh -huh. and drive. Yeah. So how did you feel about that as the parent? Um, just comforting them and uh, um, take the uh, best information about what's happening and uh, telling them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the three of you were pretty much in agreement about what you're going to do. How about the next group? Who was parent, who was adult, who was child? I was child. Uh huh. He was adult and she was parent. Uh -huh. um, we reached the decision that we were going to call our parents and let them know what was going on. Uh huh. And then we were going to stay at the hotel, but we were going to see if we could get separate rooms. Mm -hmm. And since thinking you're coming home from prom, you probably don't have money on you, you'd have to call the parents to set up some sort of arrangement with the motel. Right. So we didn't do the 100 extra miles of driving. I, as a child, was very frightened that we didn't have a plan, that things weren't going according to plan, and that I didn't know what to do because all I saw was the bridge in front of me that we couldn't cross because it wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. I'm alone. I'm not with people like my parents. Right. And I didn't know what to do. Right. So then the parents. <laughs> so how did you feel about the decision as parents? Yeah, I felt relieved as long as they um, spend the night in separate rooms <laughs> and um, they had a solution to have the money for uh -huh. the hotel. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How about one more group? Yeah. Who was parent? Who was adult? Who was child? <laughs> I was child. Uh -huh. uh, I like to have that experience. Uh, being one night with my boyfriend mm -hmm. and it was a good opportunity for me to experience that adventure because I knew that my parents didn't let me mm -hmm. in other situations so it was a good situation and then uh -huh. she was my parent uh -huh. <laughs> um, yeah um, I was speaking out as a parent and uh, somehow uh, I was trusting my child at this point and uh, and at first I was a little aggressive parent. I was really, I can reconsidered and then wanted to be, wanted to listen to my child. Okay. As adult, I had the same suggestion everybody else has had. One credit card, two rooms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we'll stop there for now. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this process. I think he, it gives you a sense of how difficult sometimes it is to come to a decision uh, with parent and child often disagreeing um, and having different wants or values or whatever. Um, ideally, what would happen in decision making is the adult would get information from the child about what the child is wanting and feeling and needing and also get information from the parent about values, concerns, ethics, so forth. And also get information about the reality factors in the situation. And make a decision that would really satisfy all three. So that all parts of the personality uh, feel comfortable with, feel good about the decision. Because um, if any part of the personality is discounting, uh, that part is going to come back to cause problems later. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, as we go along. One of the problems that we run into sometimes is what is called contamination. Uh, contamination is interference uh, of the adult from one or the other ego states, or sometimes both. For example, when you have parental contamination of the adult, uh, the, parent, the person's parent convinces the adult of um, a certain viewpoint that may be prejudicial um, and simply ignore or disregard the needs or desires or feelings of the child. 
when that happens, the victory is only short-lived because eventually the child is going to sabotage the decision in some way. The child is going to figure out a very clever way to get their needs met uh, and often uh, outsmart or go around the parent in doing so. You can also have child contamination of the adult where the child convinces the adult to go along with what he or she wants and the parent gets disregarded. And what will happen later is the parent will beat up on the child, making the child feel guilty for the decision or action that they have taken. And uh, so the person doesn't get to really enjoy uh, the decision. You can also have double contamination of the adult from both parent and child, and in which there's a kind of internal battle or power struggle going on with both parent and child trying to convince the adult of what uh, they believe or want or feel. And oftentimes when that happens, the person just goes round and round and has difficulty really arriving at a decision. Did any of the groups experience that? Where there was a real conflict between what the child wanted and the parent wanted? And you just kind of go round and round? Back here. Yeah. <laughs> But until the adult came in, the child and the parent were going back and right. forth, and I, I wanted to drive all the way, and he wanted to spend the night. Yeah. Okay. All right. He the child. Yeah. <laughs> Another problem sometimes you will experience is what is called exclusion, and... Um, that's when one or more of the ego states are simply uh, blocked out or excluded. For example, if there's heavy contamination of the adult by the parent, any time the child starts to be active, uh, the parent becomes very punitive and critical of the child. So the child may decide, um, I'll never do that again, or I won't speak up again, or whatever. And so the child wants or needs are simply excluded. You can also have exclusion of the parent where the child um, contaminates the adult and convinces the adult that what we need to do is just get rid of the parent. Then we can do what we want. And um, that's going to have consequences in the long run because we need our parent uh, to set appropriate limits and uh, operate according to uh, appropriate values and so forth. Another problem can be exclusion of the adult. If there's heavy contamination by both parent and child, uh, sometimes what the person will do uh, is exclude their adult uh, because it's so painful uh, to experience that constant battle, the person just um, uh, blocks out awareness of what's going on. The other possibility is the person can stay in a very rigid adult place and exclude both parent and child. So they don't allow themselves to really experience parent or child. They just stay in an uh, absolute adult place. Yes? Then there has to be exclusion before exclusion. Yes. Yes, exclusion usually occurs in extreme cases of contamination. Uh, exclusions are never a hundred percent because we need all three ego states uh, and there will be often some degree of each uh, but a large portion of the parent or child are excluded or adult. Um, but we can't exist without a child ego state because that's the original part of us. And we don't do very well without an adult. And we often get into trouble without a parent. Yes. So uh, our ability to make good decisions really uh, depends on our willingness to listen to all the, the input from all our ego states and that come up with a decision that really satisfies all three. For example, um, if I needed to prepare for the lecture tomorrow and there was a movie I wanted to go to see tonight, 
from my child's ego state, I might say, well, I want to go see this movie. I've been wanting to see this for a long time. So I simply go off to the movie and disregard other parts of me. And the whole time I was sitting in the movie, my parent is making me feel guilty about not preparing for the lecture tomorrow. On the other hand, I might simply side with my parent and force myself to sit down and uh, do the preparation and ignore my child needs. And the whole time I'm trying to concentrate on preparing, my child is having fantasies of how nice it would be to be off at the movies so I don't get my work done. So if I really use my adult, I can figure out that it's going to take a couple of hours to prepare. The movie is about three hours long. So I can go to the 7 o'clock movie and prepare from 9 to um, uh, 11. Or I could go to the... Um, I could prepare from 7 to 9 and, and go to the 9 o'clock movie. Either way, I get all my needs met. So while I'm in the movie, um, I'm allowing myself to really enjoy the movie and not interfering by giving myself critical parent messages. On the other side, when I sit down to study, my child is satisfied because I've already gotten to see the movie or I'm going to see it later. And my child is content to um, do the work I need to do. Uh, and there's a part of my child who's very, who enjoys being creative and so forth. So there's no conflict. Uh, it's really important to take into consideration both my parental values, my child wants and needs, and the reality factors. And uh, then I can come up with a solution that really satisfies all parts. What, I mean, after what you're saying, I have like a confusion acting as the child. Like I really wanted to be with my boyfriend, so what would be like, a, I think that the result was a choice that was between the parent and the adult, but as a child I didn't really like satisfy the... Yeah. So what you might do in that situation is if, if you were discounted and not taken into account, is you might sneak over to your boyfriend's room that night, you know, later that night. <laughs> and the child is going to be very clever in terms of figuring out how to get what they want if they're not taken into account. Uh, Jack Doucet, who again was one of Byrne's early students, he's a psychiatrist also here in uh, San Francisco, developed a diagram uh, to look at the functional ego states, critical parent, nurturing parent, adult, natural child, adapted child, and uh, just made a bar graph of uh, how people uh, use their ego states according to the amount of energy they have in each ego state. Um, for example, a person might have very high critical parent, fairly no, low nurturing parent, a moderate amount of adult, a low natural child, and high adapted child. So if you saw somebody like this, what would you say about what they're likely to be like, what their personality is going to be? They might be anxious um, because um, they probably are going to be fairly critical of themselves. Um, they're not going to uh, be very nurturing or caring towards themselves. They are going to have difficulty having fun, um, like Joan talked about with her daughter. Um, so when you look at somebody's egogram, you can get a pretty good idea of how they function. Um, and um, it, it's fairly easy to construct an egogram. You can simply have a group of people observe somebody and um, just identify which ego state uh, they experience is highest, which is next highest, and so on in the personality. And um, ideally, you want um, the nurturing parent higher than the critical or controlling parent. But it's helpful to have a moderate amount of controlling parent. Um, you also need a, a moderate amount of adult, um, a fair amount of natural child, so the person uh, knows how to play and enjoy themselves, and a moderate amount of uh, adapted child in terms of being able to take turns and share and 
be cooperative and things like that. Ideally, you want the middle three higher than the two ends. Um, this is also a helpful diagram uh, in terms of looking at relationships. Um, is there somebody who would like to know more about um, how you function in relation to some significant other in your life? Who would be willing to do a, uh, a exercise for a minute? Okay. So the other person you want to look at is the person that you want to look at in terms of uh, this exercise. Anyone who is volunteering. I don't no, know. I mean, I want somebody, you want, you want you to do it with somebody significant in your life. Oh. It, it could be a partner, it could be um, somebody you work with, whoever. A friend. Okay. Uh, so let's say that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, an easy way to do this. is just to diagram five divisions. So again, we have critical parent, nurturing parent, adult, natural child, and adapted child. And as you look at those, which ego state do you experience the strongest in yourself? Nurturing parent. Nurturing parent. Okay. And adult. Okay. So nurturing parent would be highest? Yeah. And adult. And then adult would be next. And after that? Uh, nurturing child to some extent. Natural child? Natural child, yeah. Okay. To some extent. Not a lot, but... Okay, and then next, highest? Next highest would be critical parent. Okay, so, and lowest would be adapted child? Yeah. Okay. Obviously, this is somebody who's going to be very nurturing um, towards other people in relationship. Uh, they have um, fairly high adults, so they're going to be making good decisions and know how to play and have fun. Um, so the person you want to look at in relation to you is who? Uh, my sister-in-law. Okay. And what would you say is highest in her personality? Which ego state? Uh, critical. Critical parents. Okay. So her critical parent would go all the way to the bottom. Um, so there would be an overlap of this much in terms of that functioning. What would be the next highest ego state for her? Adaptive child. Adaptive child. So uh, those would just meet. What would be next? Uh, next would be adult. Adult. Okay. So there would be an overlap here. The next? Uh, next would be uh, um, natural child. Natural child. And then the last would be nurturing parent. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see from this relationship, um, they're going to be able to solve problems well together because they um, have a fair amount of overlap in terms of their adult processing. Uh, they're going to be nurturing of one another. Um, uh, her friend or family member it may be a little overly controlling at times. 
towards her, and they would have a moderate amount of fun together, and there wouldn't be a lot of child to child conflict mm -hmm. in the relationship. Does that describe? Yeah, that's, that's accurate. Yeah. So you can really tell what's going on in the relationship uh, by comparing the egograms, one from the bottom, one from the top. And where there's overlap, you're going to uh, see uh, a lot of energy taking place. Where there is the, the lines just meet, uh, there's going to be a sharing of that function. Um, and sometimes you will find gaps, like sometimes there'll be a gap in in natural child and the people won't be very good at playing with each other for example enjoying each other so you can do this with a spouse with a employee employer employee uh, with a uh, friend whomever uh, with a supervisee and you can tell a lot about the relationship and what's happening in the relationship by simply uh, drawing out the egogram for each party any questions about that? That's yes. Egogram. Mm -hmm. If you Google, if you enter, if you enter egogram, there are some like tests that'll give you yours. Right. Yeah. There are a number of people who have developed different tests for assessing egograms, and you can do it that way. Uh, you can also. All of us have a pretty good sense of what is highest and what's next highest and so forth. Um, and you can also have a group of people observe a single individual and draw out their egogram. And you'll find that people can do that with a high degree of consistency. So it's a nice little tool to look at what's happening in relationships. I want to move on to the second major area of transactional analysis, which has to do with uh, looking at what happens when we get together with another person to communicate. And it becomes interesting since each of us have three ego states that we're operating with. So uh, what I'd like to do is do another exercise just to illustrate that. If we can have two of the groups that um, we're doing the exercise together previously. Um, are there two groups who would like to volunteer to do that? What do is just to um, line up three chairs facing this way, and this group's going to do it also. So if you'll line up three chairs facing toward them, just just bring your chair out. Uh, you don't. You don't have to. You can move your chair back because it'll be the three people back there. So who was parent? Okay, if you'll come here, just come on up a little closer. And who was adult? And so if you'll be in middle and you were child, on the end, over there. Uh, who was parent here? Okay, so if you'll sit here opposite the parent, and you were adult, if you will sit in the middle, and child on the end. Yeah. Okay. If you have any trouble see, uh, seeing, stand up or come closer. So, these are the two parents, the two adults, and the two children. And I want you to be the three ego states of the 17-year-old female. And you be the three ego states of the 17-year-old boy, boyfriend. And it's the same situation. This time, though, you're going to come to a joint decision with each other. So, any one of you can talk to any one of you. And you can also talk internally. So you have both options. You can talk with each other internally or you can talk externally to any ego state in the other person. Yeah, you're the girl, he's the boy. <laughs> okay? Right. 
Right. So go ahead and talk about how you're going to handle the situation. Oh, come on. This was like a situation situation sent by God. We have to <laughs> sleep together. <laughs> it, it's our first time. I mean, both of us, we've never tried it. It's going to be so cool and fun and exciting. And I mean, we can try again. <laughs> Yes, I do agree with you, but I'm a little afraid of my dad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the adult of the 17-year-old girl. I would be talking to my 17-year-old just, child. Just role play it. Okay. Yeah. Um, if, we make, if we make a mistake here, it could be a life-changing problem. And I really think we should consider this carefully. It's true that they may not know if we stay in separate rooms, but the consequences for this are serious, and we have to acknowledge that. And who responds? Were you going to say something? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you want to respond? Okay. I mean, we can use a condom. <laughs> <laughs> We can, I mean, they've taught us how to do that. We feel pretty comfortable. The reality is I've never had one. I don't have one, so that's out. <laughs> <laughs> Motels have condoms. I know her dad hunts. <laughs> He's got guns. It's not reversible, so. Yes, I'm a little afraid, really, of my dad. I don't know if they guess that we are together, and maybe they will check and. I'm really afraid, but I like to be with you. <laughs> I mean, I love you. You love me back. We're going to have fun. I can protect you, and it's going to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't drive the 100 miles, her dad will. <laughs> I would still, I, I think it's good to be afraid of my dad. That's all right. But when it comes down to life, I have to make decisions for myself. And um, it's important to think about the consequences of decisions. Uh, the only thing for me is that, that the logic that you told me doesn't convince me. Uh, I'm only afraid of my, my dad, so maybe I will listen to him and... <laughs> Because with with this choice, uh, that uh, adult uh, consequence doesn't happen, and this is the only thing that I have to pay some uh, penalty for my decision with my dad. <laughs> this is the only thing. Mm. We, we don't have to tell anybody. I mean, we can keep it a secret and. You know, <laughs> we're going to be in different rooms and whatever. Child contamination of the adult is called rationalization. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. Good job. So again, I think you can see the difficulty that sometimes we have in communication with another person with, with all of that noise going on inside in terms of input from all of those ego states. As I was mentioning, when the, when the child contaminates the adult, um, the child tries to make what is irrational appear rational by rationalization. And uh, the person is not using their full adult ego state, they're only 
looking at the evidence that would rationalize them, uh, enable them to rationalize what they want to do. Parental contamination of the adult is often referred to as prejudice. And again, the, the parent is really using the adult to look at what the adult, um, uh, what the parent already believes. And um, <clears throat> the type of thinking that often goes on is called justification. We look for the facts that would justify what we already believe to be true, rather than looking objectively at the total reality. So the important thing is um, making sure we're looking at all the evidence and not just what we already believe to be true or want to be true, so we can be objective in the data that we gather. When we look at um, the, the transactions that take place between people, uh, that's referred to as TA proper. And the definition of a transaction from Byrne is a transaction is the basic unit of social discourse, which is made up of both a transactional stimulus and a response. So you have to have both a stimulus and a response for it to be a transaction. Um, if one person says something but the other person doesn't respond, um, it's not a complete transaction. There are three types of transactions. The first are called complementary, and that's when the ego state that is addressed in the other person is also the ego state that responds. Uh, like the child saying, uh, the guy saying, here's our chance, and the girl says, well, I'm a little afraid of my dad. Uh, that's a complementary transaction, child to child. A second type of transaction is called a cross transaction and that's when the ego state that is addressed is not the ego state that responds. Um, for example, um, the, the girl saying, well this does feel like, or, or the guy says, um, the girl says, I'm, I'm scared of my dad, talking to the other child and the parent says, he's got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> the ego state that is responding is not the ego state that is addressed. And when transactions are crossed like that, uh, there may be a lot of noise, but the people won't be really communicating. Um, so communication breaks down, and one or the other people or both have to switch ego states in order to reestablish communication. The third type of transaction is an ulterior transaction where there are two different messages being communicated at the same time. Um, so one is on the social level, uh, but there's also an implied transaction on the psychological level. Uh, and whenever there are ulterior transactions, the most significant message is going to be on the psychological level because that's the one that's going to determine the behavioral outcome. And I want to diagram these for you just to show you what they look like. Uh, there are two types. One is called an angular and the other is called a duplex, ulterior transaction. Um, the angular ulterior transaction is when the stimulus would come from the same ego state in the first person and be directed to two different ego states in the second person. For example, um, if the salesperson comes up to you and says, uh, you know, you're debating about whether to buy something and the person says the sale goes off today, um, you know, they're ostensibly giving you adult information. The psychological level down to your child from their adult is don't miss out to try to get you to buy this product today. In a duplex transaction, uh, the stimulus on the social level is coming from one ego state and a different ego state on the psychological level. For example, if on the adult level the person, the, a guy says to the girl, would you like to come up to my apartment and look at my etchings? Is that his real intention? Probably not. On the child level, he's saying, um, let's go fool around. 
And so he's communicating something in an ulterior way rather than being overt and direct about it. And uh, I'll just show you diagrams of these to, to see what the different ones look like. Uh, in a complementary transaction, uh, the ego states, the vectors between them, the transactional vectors, will be parallel. The stimulus will be directed at uh, a particular ego state, uh, and that's the ego state that responds. And those can be between any two ego states. It can be adult to adult, parent to parent, child to child. Or it can be child to parent, parent to child, child to adult, adult to child, <coughs> and so on. As long as the vectors are parallel and the ego state that is addressed is the ego state that responds, the people will understand each other and communication will be effective. What happens in a cross transaction again is that the ego state that is addressed is not the ego state that responds and the vectors are crossed. Um, person might say, what time is it? And the other person respond, why don't you buy your own watch? Um, so, um, the person is asking for information, they're getting a rebellious response from the other person's child up to their parent. And they won't be really understanding or communicating. Uh, so one or both people are going to have to shift ego states in order to reestablish communication. For example, the, the first person might say, um, it's not, uh, um, what, I, what I really would like to know is the information about the time. Um, will you tell me? And if, the other, if he succeeds in getting the other person to shift to their adult, then communication would, would be reestablished. Uh, or he could shift to nurturing parent and say, you sound upset. I'm sorry if I uh, uh, disturbed you. Um, are you available to tell me the information? So it's... Pardon? That would still be crossed because of the people the parents of the adults. Uh, if he addresses the other person's child, though, he's addressing their upset feelings. He's saying from a nurturing place, I'm sorry if I uh, upset you. Uh, are you willing to give me the information? Then he's inviting the other person to switch also to their adult. So he's first nurturing to meet the person where they are and then inviting them to shift with him back to adult. So you... And it depends on whether the second person shifts or not. I see what you mean. Yeah. It would also be possible just to say from the parent, parent, that's none of your damn business. Yeah. Right. Which would be they would communicate. a complimentary transaction. Right. But it wouldn't succeed in getting him the time. That's true. <laughs> right. In an ulterior angular transaction, like the one I mentioned, If uh, the salesman says to the customer, the sale goes off today, on the social level, on the psychological level, what they may be saying, again, is don't miss out. And the person might say back from their adult, uh, well, I'll go ahead and buy it today. On, their on the child level, they're saying, yeah, I don't want to miss out. Uh, a lot of advertising involves angular transactions um, and often is an adult maneuver to try to get the other person to respond uh, uh, their appeals to either their child or parent to get them to buy a product. If you look at the advertising on TV, uh, if you want to be one with the world, you have to drink Coca-Cola, right? If you want to be um, a good parent, you have to use loves rather than pampers or whatever. So there are all of these appeals to both the child and parent to try to motivate them to buying a certain product. In a duplex transaction, um, a student might bring in a paper late and say to the professor, 
Um, I'm sorry the paper's late. I stayed up all night working on it. Um, on the psychological level, uh, they may be saying, uh, I've been a bad boy. I, I haven't uh, gotten the paper in on time. Please forgive me. And the professor might say back, on the adult level, well, I'll make an exception this time. And on the psychological level, what he's saying back is, okay, I'll forgive you and accept your paper. So the real communication, the significant communication in uh, both types of ulterior transactions are uh, taking place at the psychological level. And that that's what of the transaction. Any questions? about those? Yes. If there is no um, action back, then there's no transaction. But right. what about extreme passivity? Um, people are not responding or there's actually statements made but no action taking place? Mm -hmm. You know, adult relationships? Um, yeah, so passivity, could that not fall into, I guess, a way of crossed transaction where something comes to a halt or a still stand or, um, yeah. Um, in, in the example that you gave, it's more likely to be an ulterior transaction. They're saying yes, but on the psychological level, they're saying, I don't really want to do that. Right, yeah. Yes. I don't really understand the difference between angular and duplex. Angular is simply the, sim the stimulus on both the social and psychological levels are coming from the same ego state. That's the only difference. Whereas in a duplex, they're coming from different ego states, two different ego states. Other questions? So the rules of communication are whenever the transactions are complementary, communication can proceed indefinitely. The people will be understanding each other. Whenever the transactions are crossed, communication breaks down, and one or both people have to change ego states in order to reestablish communication. There may be a lot of noise, but people are really not communicating. Yeah. The third rule is whenever the transactions are ulterior, the behavioral outcome will be determined by the psychological level. So that's why it's so important to do what Burns said about thinking Martian. You know, pay attention to what the implied communication is, what's really being said here, rather than just the social level, the surface level. Now, as, as long as people are not having any problem, any difficulty communicating, you really don't need this. But once there's a problem, it gives you a specific set of tools to analyze the transactions and to figure out what the problem is and to correct that. And that's really the value of TA proper. There's one other type of transaction that's very important to know about in therapy, which is called a gallows transaction. And this is when someone laughs at or jokes about their own self-destructive or non-productive behavior and invites other people to laugh also, which helps to reinforce the behavior. Um, a classic example are, is that sometimes alcoholics will tell funny stories about their latest binge, and they're doing that to entertain the people they're talking to and to get them laughing. But the psychological level message up to the other person's parent is, aren't you pleased with my self-destructive behavior? And by laughing back, the person is saying, yes, I am. Keep it up so I can be entertained. But it's really a very dysfunctional thing for the person because they're getting reinforced in very negative, destructive behavior. People learn to do that in life situations early on when they may be a little kid and uh, father says to son, uh, don't you dare kick Jimmy in the shins, ha, 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 ha. 
And he's communicating a double message. He's saying, don't do that on the social level, but the psychological level is, if you want to keep me entertained, then do it. Or a parent who says, go to the store, but don't you dare steal any candy. Huh, never thought about that. You know, he's giving his child a double message. And again, the behavioral outcome is going to be determined by that psychological level message. So, any questions about transactions? <clears throat> Yes. In a therapeutic situation, I'm thinking of a, a gentleman who I think uses gallows transactions with me often and then is inviting me to laugh along. Uh -huh. And when I don't, it's sort of like, well, that's the expected response. Mm -hmm. Is that fairly common? Yes. Okay. Um, what's important is when somebody is doing that to simply say to them um, I don't experience that as funny it sounds self it sounds destructive to you and um, in order to confront that behavior because oftentimes the person is not even aware of what they're doing but it invites them to think about what it is they're really doing and the destructiveness of that behavior sometimes he'll he'll comment on some behavior his mom and dad demonstrated in front of him that's really inappropriate but sort of acts as if it was an everyday thing. Right. And I'll say, well, that's not really appropriate. Good. Yeah. Thank you. That's important. Yeah. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about psychological hungers. Byrne realized that just like a lot of behavior is motivated by certain physical hungers, uh, like food, shelter, clothing, things like that, there are also certain psychological hungers that motivate a great deal of our behavior. And these are stimulus hunger, uh, which gets sublimated into what's called recognition hunger and he used the general colloquial term stroke hunger to represent both of those. A stroke is basically any act of recognition or attention. Um, second type of psychological hunger is structure hunger which has, a, has as a corollary leadership hunger. We often look for leaders uh, to provide meaningful ways of structuring our time. Most of the time when people are in a group that doesn't have a leader, the first thing they do is elect one in order to have some structure to the group. Uh, so they're not just sitting there floundering, not knowing what to do. A third type of hunger that Byrne did not talk so much about, but Claude Steiner talked about is what he called position hunger. And that's a hunger, psychological hunger, to maintain the basic existential position in terms of being okay or not okay um, that we decided upon or concluded very early based on how we were interacted with. And I'll talk about each of these in a little more depth. Uh, first of all, um, I'll talk a little bit about stimulus hunger and recognition hunger, which again goes under the basic category of stroke hunger. Human beings are one of the very few organisms that are born without a complete nervous system. Most other animals are, uh, have a completed nervous system at birth. Um, probably the apes are that we're descended from are the only other 
uh, mammal that doesn't have a complete nervous system. And the way that nervous system gets uh, completed is through stimulation. Uh, and a lot of that is physical as the parents are caressing the child, handling the child, holding the child, and so forth. That stimulation, physical stimulation, helps complete um, the nerves in the backbone and in the uh, brain. Um, and uh, that stimulation is very necessary uh, on a daily basis, as Vern said, to keep our backbones from shriveling up. Uh, we need that kind of stimulation in terms of completing our nervous system. As kids become toddlers and begin to climb down off of mother or father's lap and explore the world around them, uh, a kind word or look or a gesture, you know, recognition is almost as satisfying as a physical caress. Not quite. Uh, but we become more and more willing to accept recognition in the place of stimulation. But we never totally outgrow our need for stimulation. Um, we need lots of stimulation daily in order to function well psychologically. And the people who have the hardest time with that are the very young and the very old because they're le they have less ability to really um, uh, seek out or uh, uh, acquire stimulation. Uh, they're more dependent on others because they're less able to move around physically and interact and so forth. And again, as I mentioned earlier, to the extent that kids are not automatically getting positive recognition or stimulation, they become very good at going after negative stimulation. Uh, because it's often much more predictable. Kids who develop attention and deficit disorder uh, are basically experiencing a deficit of attention. And they become very good at attracting attention. By being hyperactive often, or figuring out all kinds of clever ways to get teachers and parents and others to pay attention. If you think about an infant that mother is holding and nursing, almost the entire body of the infant is re receiving stimulation. Um, the sucking reflex uh, not only involves the mouth, but it actually involves the whole GI tract and the pelvic structure of the child rocks as the child sucks. In addition to that, mother and father, or mother whoever is holding the child, is often caressing the child's body, playing with their fingers and toes and hair and face and so forth um, as the child is nursing. So there's almost a total bodily stimulation involved in that uh, nursing process. As we become toddlers, we get less and less of that kind of stimulation. I had one client who, when he was an, a little kid, uh, his parents seldom picked him up, and he remembers making the decision um, that he didn't want to learn to walk. Because his fear was if he learned to walk, they'd never pick him up again. And so kids make all kinds of adaptive decisions uh, based on what they're experiencing and their need for stimulation. Um, so that's a very important hunger that all of us have all our lives. Uh, positive recognition helps us feel okay about ourselves. Negative attention, negative strokes, negative recognition <laughs> Um, causes us to feel bad, but at least we survive. What children cannot tolerate is indifference. And that's why in cases of extreme lack of stimulation, kids will actually fail to thrive. So if we look at the different types of strokes, they can be physical, 
Uh, they can be verbal. Uh, they can be nonverbal, look or gesture. They can be positive. Uh, they can be negative. They can be conditional for doing something, uh, like uh, uh, hitting that home run was fantastic. Or they can be unconditional for just being. I love you, or you're uh, fun to be with, or whatever, in which the child is getting attention for simply being. Positive self-esteem results from getting both. We need to feel lovable, and we feel lovable by getting strokes for being. We also need to feel competent, and we, get, we learn to feel competent by getting strokes for doing. So we need a healthy diet of both, daily. Um, so I want you to do an exercise for a minute just to experience what these different forms of stroking feel like. So get a partner, choose a partner next to you. Everybody got somebody? And I'd like for you, first of all, to give your partner um, a positive stroke for doing. It may be something that you've seen them do here. Um, um, or it may be that you need to make it up. But um, tell them something you like about something that they've done. And just see what that feels like. And do it both ways. Um, what did that feel like? Felt good. Felt good? Good. Okay. So now give your partner a positive stroke for just being and see how that feels and do it both ways. It can be physical or verbal. <laughs> um, how was that? Did you like that? Which did you like better, a stroke for doing or a stroke for being? being. Yeah. Because uh, it's just an unconditional affirmation of you as a human being. Um, those are the most fulfilling strokes of all, unconditional positive strokes for being. We need a few negative strokes for doing to let us know uh, what, where the boundaries are. Um, but we need a ratio of about five to one positive to negative strokes. It's, it's interesting that John Gottman, who's probably the foremost researcher on marital therapy, discovered that the number one factor of whether a couple would stay together or not is a ratio of five to one positive to negative interactions. They may be fighting every day, but as long as there's a ratio of five to one positive to negative interactions, they will tell you they have a satisfying marriage. Huh? F five positive. Positive to one negative, to every negative. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, when we can't get positive strokes or feel like we don't deserve them, then we go after negative. And we become ingenious in terms of, of our ability to get negative attention. And a lot of that has to do with what are called psychological games that we'll talk about uh, tomorrow. But for now, I want you to experience the difference between um, a stroke, which is giving attention, and a discount, which is the failure to give attention. So I want you to turn to your partner and say hello, and the partner just turn away. And do that both ways, and just see what that feels like.
Okay. Um, let me have your attention again. Do you experience how awful that feels? How many had the impulse to either grab the person or shake them or provoke them in some way? Yeah. So when people fail to give us recognition or attention, uh, we naturally want to um, force them to in some way. We often use negative behaviors to do that. Because again, we can't survive as kids. We learn that. We can't really uh, get along without some recognition or attention. As one person put it, it's better to be notorious than not recognized at all. And, um, you know, a lot of criminal, criminal behavior has to do with uh, learning how as a kid to get negative strokes. And people continue those patterns later on. The one type of stroke that we don't need is a negative stroke for being. Because it implies that we don't have worth or value as human beings, which is not true. All the other strokes, ways of stroking are functional and helpful in different contexts. But none of us need negative strokes for being. Yeah. A question. If uh, for, for children, for education of children, as a mother, uh, is it true if a child doing some bad thing, uh, you, you, for example, for one hour you don't uh, talk to her or just preferable to have bad conversation instead of not talking at all? I think it's very important um, to talk with the child about what they've done that you don't like and why. And then, this pardon? The solution, I mean, yeah. yeah. And um, to catch them at good behavior mm -hmm. or to give them uh, recognition before they have misbehaved. If you give kids a sufficient amount of positive strokes with a sufficient intensity, they don't go into negative behavior. And that's true not only with kids, it's true with employees and organizations, it's true with students in school, uh, in almost every human context we deal with. People are most likely to go into negative behavior when they're not getting a sufficient positive recognition. Okay, um, I think this might be a good place to take a break. Uh, at, we'll take one more question and then. Um, you, you characterize the example where we say, say hello and our partner turns away as discount. Yes. And so this is the first time I thought of the discount being. Well, it's, it's a failure to give recognition. Gotcha. It's discounting the stimulus that the person has provided. Okay. So inaction, in this case, is the discount. Or failure to respond. You failure know, to, to recognize. respond. Yes. Right. Okay, let's take a break for 15 minutes and...